to be leading us in our singing, and our first song is Hosanna. Let's all stand together and, and praise God. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. pray with me. Father, we're so grateful for this opportunity to come together this first day of the week to come worship you with our fellow Christians. We are still praying, Father, for this country, Father, and the different avenues it has taken. Father, we do pray for uh, unity. Father, we pray for uh, people coming back together and opening things up, especially to come to worship freely. Father, we pray pray for this congregation, those that cannot be with us and those online that still cannot get out. Father, we pray for uh, our mindset to uh, go out into this this state and this uh, town to invite people to come visit with us too. We ask you to be with Sean, Father, and our elders and our deacons here to that help lead us and get things going again. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Let's bow at this time. Our Father, we come this morning and we're thankful for this opportunity that we have to come together as Christians and enjoy each other's fellowship and worship. And at this particular time to uh, remember the sacrifice of your son. And Father, we take this bread remembering the body that was the example and took the pain and the suffering on our behalf. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's bow again, please. Father, at this time we remember the sacrifice, the blood that makes the remission of sin possible. And from the beginning of time, blood has been the price for sin. And Father, we are th so thankful that your son paid the ultimate price so that we could obtain forgiveness, complete remission of sin. And we're thankful for that sacrifice and his suffering. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. There are several ways indicated on the screen that we can uh, give, uh, contribute to the work of the church here. So let's have a word of prayer at this time. Our Heavenly Father, at this time we're thankful for the ability that we have to, to take care of our families, to uh, feed and clothe and provide for them. And Father, we are mindful of these blessings that we have knowing that all good things come from you. And Father, we give, uh, give willingly and joyfully to the work of the church here. And as our prayer, Father, we would uh, use the funds with wisdom uh, to the benefit of this, the community here, to the lost souls. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Well, good morning. I hope you had a great weekend. Let me tell you right off the bat, my left ear is completely stopped up. So I have no idea if I am shouting at you or whispering to you. So I, Larry's going to take care of us in here, but I apologize to those who are watching at home because you are constantly having to probably up and down your volume. So I just, I just want to get that out there. But in uh, sinus season, allergy season, wonderful. And some of that comes to you at different times of the year. But uh, it seems to, to always be coming, right? Something's always changing. And uh, this time last year, wow, didn't it look different? And so this year we can say, Melba, how about them hogs, right? Them Oma hogs. And so uh, what a great weekend for Razorback fans. That was good. Uh, but um, again, just evidence of things that are different, things that life always changes. And that is for our lives. That's for the world around us. And so we once again are going to be going through a little bit of a change. So a year ago, um, January, is when... Uh, things changed on our staff. And so uh, Ashlyn was hired. She was hired uh, to be our, uh, our um, Minister of Communications and of uh, Connection. And so uh, when uh, Ruth, you remember Ruth Busby was here. So when Ruth was here and she decided to retire, um, we, we sat down, the elders sat down with the staff and said, uh, you know, what, what does the congregation need? And we knew we needed somebody who could focus on uh, the way we thought things were trending, which was through uh, the internet, through social media, through uh, things like that. We did not at that time expect to be streaming our services every week. And so uh, unbeknownst to her, we were talking about this as Ashlyn was, was approaching, uh, getting ready to, to finish school. And so um, she uh, came to the elders and said, I would like to do this for Summers Avenue. And they said, well, you know what? We actually need somebody who can do this for Summers Avenue. And so uh, to fill that gap between the, the year she was finishing up uh, college at Harding, uh, Brenda McKee stepped in and filled that year. And so then uh, Ashland started in uh, January last year, ready to go and, and get started. And then COVID hit. <laughs> and so uh, because of her, we were able to stream our services uh, to you all last year. And we were able to connect with you and stay connected at times when we couldn't be in here in person. And so just wanted to let you know that Ashlyn has been offered a job at Arkansas Business Publishing Group. And it's a position that she has been uh, looking for and wanting to do. And that's Digital Marketing Coordinator. And so uh, this is the, she's got about two weeks left with us. And then she's going to be transitioning uh, into her new job. And so just wanted to let you know that so that you can connect with her and let her know how much you appreciate what she has been able to do for the congregation. And so uh, she's going to be out of town the next couple of weekends. Uh, so we want to make sure that you knew that today. But uh, you, look, you look at our social media and her fingerprints are on that. You look at our streaming and she helped get that going. You look at the after school mentoring uh, that uh, River City or Silver City Church has been doing. Uh, she's been involved in that. She's been helping out uh, with uh, our, our youth, our teens, uh, our summer's kids. And so uh, we appreciate so much uh, her connection to the congregation. But she's not leaving us. She's just leaving uh, the position. And so she's still going to be a part of the congregation and doing uh, some things in a volunteer capacity uh, that she wants to do. But uh, we certainly appreciate her, and the elders are going to have uh, something for that, and I think going to have a, a, a prayer for her uh, towards the end of the service. But we want to get that out because she's going to be traveling uh, and because we're going through a transition, and so that you will know, the congregation will know. And so uh, as, as we get together with the elders and decide um, how we move forward and, and how we can best serve you, uh, you can reach out to, to me or to Jonathan or to Oren uh, for any of your you know, administrative needs that you have. And so um, be praying for that and pray for Ashlyn in this new phase of her life as she, uh, as she sets out uh, for her uh, dreams as a, as a young person with the whole world in front of her. And so we're, we're glad for that. So in the South Asian country of India, there are tourists that flock to see what at first glance looks like an expansive forest. Uh, if you flew over from the top, you'd say, well, that's, a, that's kind of a pretty thick forest down there. And so um, these branches create this extensive canopy over the, the Bose Botanical Garden. And so the most interesting thing about this collection of plant life, though, is that it's not a collection at all. 
It is in fact one massive tree known simply as the Great Banyan Tree. And so it occupies the better part of five acres and, and is almost 250 years old. And so this land, if you think about how big is that, well, it, it's covered, the banyan tree covers the better part of five acres. This church property, the, from the front curb all the way to the back, is about three acres. So this tree covers more, almost twice as much property as this church building and all. So how in the world could a single tree cover nearly 218,000 square feet of space, grow branches as high as 80 feet in the air, and thrive for over two and a half centuries? How could that happen? Well, all banyans fall under the super cute and not at all threatening sounding category of strangler figs. <laughs> They're strangler figs. And this means that the tree grows from seeds that land on other trees. And as the, the, the seeds take set there, they, they, it sends their own roots down to smother the roots of the, these other trees. And then they grow into these smaller uh, supporting branches that look like new tree trunks. And so it's a magnificent looking, just from the pictures, I haven't been there in person, but banyans start life as a seed that germinates on another tree, grows as a vine dependent on the tree for support. And so this means that Eventually, the, it strangles the host tree, and it absorbs into this new structure, it absorbs that into what is now an independent organism. It takes what was once independent and makes it dependent on them. And so as it matures and grows roots from, from this outward extending branches, they reach the ground and become trunk-like and expands the footprint of the tree. It continues to grow and move outward and outward and outward. And this has garnered, garnered for it the nickname of the walking tree. And so culture expands much like a banyan tree. It spreads the seeds of social behavior until it finds enough willing and unwilling hosts who allow those seeds to germinate, sending its roots of behavior and thinking deep into the lives of more and more people. And so I've used the word culture many times in, in preaching. We talk, we talk about culture. And in fact, this series is about swimming against the currents of culture. But what is culture? What do I mean by that? Well, simply put, culture is a, a word for the way of life of a group of people. It's the way people do things. It, it involves their outlook, their attitudes, their values, uh, their morals, their goals. It involves customs. It involves all these things that are shared by a society. It's the program or the system by which society operates. And this can be a micro society because the culture of a, fa a family has culture. And the culture of a family can be maybe uh, they participate in recreational activities together. Or maybe they love camping. And so that's the thing that their family does. We say, well, that's just what they do. That's a culture of that family. Maybe instilling personal responsibility in their children. That's their family culture. Or maybe uh, everybody contributes to the upkeep of things that are used by the family. That's a cultural aspect of the family. And, and, and for us here today, it's also church involvement, things we do here as church. And so it's the way we do things. And culture is not good or bad. Culture is just what it is. It's what it is. What, what determines the goodness or what determines the badness of culture is the standard by which one evaluates that culture. And for us as Christians, it should go without saying that our standard is the Word of God. Because God's Word is the only true standard. Because God is the only true authority and rule on human life. And so Scripture uses the word world when it refers to, to the sinful, negative aspect of culture. And we should not expect someone who doesn't believe in God or someone who doesn't believe in Jesus or someone who has not surrendered their life to Christ as Lord of their life, we shouldn't expect them to live up to God's standards. We want them to, but we should not be surprised when they don't. In some cases, they might. But it wouldn't be necessarily because they, they want to honor a higher power. It might be more along the lines of what Paul writes in Romans chapter 2 and verse 14, where he says, For whenever the Gentiles, that's those who do not believe in God, those who are not Christian, the Gentiles who do not have the law, do by nature the things required by the law. These who do not have the law are law to themselves. So he's talking about, hey, Jews, you, you believe in God, you followed God, you've lived under the law of Moses. 
And so you are held accountable to the law of Moses. And when they violate the law of Moses, they know that because they see in the law, we violated this, it's in the law. He says, but there are those who don't have the law who are law to themselves. They show that the work of the law is written in their hearts as their conscience bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or else defend them when they don't do things that are right. So this is a natural sense of basic morality, and that is seated in every human being by God our Creator. And so even non-Christians tend to do a lot of Christian things or tend to act in a lot of Christian ways. I can do air quotes on that. But good morality is not the defining requirement by God of His creation. Faith in Christ is His requirement. So but back to my point. The motivation to do good for those in Christ is different than for those who do not know Christ. And so because there's a different standard by which people live, then we can expect different choices. We can expect different lifestyles. We can expect different culture from those who are not disciples of Christ. And they should expect different from us. And so Scripture uses the term the world to draw this contrast between Christians and non-Christians. And we're cautioned to be in the world, to live among the world's culture, to engage in the culture of the world, but not be found of the world. Don't become part of a banyan culture to this world. But this requires us to swim upstream. And that can be tiring, and it can be frustrating, and sometimes you know, very obvious to those who are going with the cultural flow. Hey, you're doing something different than everybody else. Well, on one hand, there's this withdrawal mentality. When we try to relate to culture, we, sometimes we want to withdraw. You know, Christianity is not really here to fix the world. I'm just here to get me to heaven, you know? And sometimes we can fall into that. And so then on the other extreme, it says, well, Christians should take power. We should just seize everything and make this world the way we think it ought to be. And in both of these, there's this talk of, of transforming culture and making it the way that it ought to be. But does that fit in Scripture? Does it fit in the Gospel? And so one way says we can change this by our own effort. We can make this happen. Our own strength. And the other says, no, we're just, things are just fine the way they are. Let's just be quiet and just settle in and just kind of you know, go with the flow. But what does gospel say? How does the gospel speak to this? Well, for starters, the gospel tells us that we are saved by grace through faith, and that's not anything of ourselves. That's nothing we've done. That's a gift from God, right, through Jesus Christ. And so at the same time, when you receive that gift... It changes you. You're changed by that. You cannot be fine the way you are because things are no longer the way they were. And you are no longer the way you were. And so you're a new, different creation. True faith issues in change. And so instead of thinking about changing the world's culture or withdrawing from the world's culture, maybe we should consider how do we engage the world's culture? So you remember when Jesus was on trial uh, before Pilate, Governor Pilate, right before his crucifixion. And so Pilate is bemused by how Jesus' own people, meaning the Jews, they're the ones who had him arrested. And so in John chapter 18 and verse 36, we read Jesus replies to Pilate, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my servants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to Jewish authorities. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. And so ask yourself, how many people have been killed in wars or conflict over the centuries on behalf of the kingdom of God? How many people have died, been killed in the name of Christ through this? Well, I would say perhaps one more than was authorized by Jesus. See, Pilate expected an uprising. He expected conflict. He expected a fight. And Jesus tells him, Pilate, that's your kingdom culture. That's not my kingdom culture. That's not how we do things in the kingdom of God. And so when you look at the life of Jesus and his teaching, it sure seems like integrating humble faith, engaging the world as Christians, but still working together for the common good. It sure seems like that was the way of Jesus. And so cultural engagement while avoiding the extremes. And how has it changed? Well, how has the gospel changed? Has the gospel changed? So I believe the gospel gives our heart the ability to humbly appreciate contributions by everyone 
Christians and non-Christians, when you look around. I believe it gives us the ability to humbly cooperate with those who are not Christian to work for the common good. And I believe the gospel gives us courage and insight to humbly and respectfully provoke the culture and say, hey, you know, there are a lot of ways that work needs to be done differently. There are a lot of ways that, that this needs to happen differently. And public life needs to be conducted in a different way. So humble cooperation along with a respectful provocation. So the gospel should shape the way that you lead. The way you lead in your vocation, the way you lead in your job, the way you lead in school, the way you lead on your teams and in your clubs. See, the gospel not only makes you humble about other people's work, it not only shapes your work, but it also changes the way you relate to other people in your profession. It's the way in which you lead and the way you handle relationships. A gospel-focused disciple is not one who's trying to change the culture around them. A gospel-focused disciple is one who illuminates, one who shines a spotlight on the culture of the kingdom of Jesus. And Jesus himself talked about this, right? He said this is a compelling light. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14, he says, Disciples, you are the light of the world. A city located on a hill cannot be hidden. People do not light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so that they can see your good deeds and give honor to your Father in heaven. Let your light shine before others. But he doesn't tell us to let our light shine in the face, in the eyes of others so that we annoy them so much they reject any connection that we're trying to make with them. We're not that per supposed to be that person who won't dim their bright lights. It's approaching with respect and humility, as we talked about last week. And so when the light of our life, when the light of the culture of the kingdom of God shines, where others can not only see the light, but also see what the light is illuminating. There will be no mistaking evidence of a different cultural choice, a better cultural choice. And some people don't even know there's a better choice. And especially when Christians either hide the culture of Christ or we push it to the extremes and in fact push some away. And one of those extremes is that well, Christians need to go back out there and take back the culture. We need to seize it back. But what we fail to recognize is that the world is full of the glory of God. If we looked around, we could see it. If we looked for it, we could see it. God is doing His work through all kinds of people, some of whom may not be Christians. And one theologian has said to consider when you pray. You know, we, we talked about, you know, Jesus taught His disciples. They said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And He, he taught them how to pray. And one of the, one of the phrases in there, He said, give us our, this day... Our daily bread, right? And so one theologian looked at this and said, you know, when you think about that, give us this day our daily bread. Instead of having the bread miraculously appear on the table, think about how God works through bakers. He works through merchants. He works through people who transport the flour. He works through entire industries. And so in other words, what God does in answering our requests as Christians is to give, produce, make it happen, sometimes through the work of other people. And so how many of you have been healed? How many of you have been therapied? How many of you have been treated or cared for by someone in the medical field who is not a Christian? Somewhere down that line, I guarantee you have been. And when you prayed for relief, and you prayed for healing, and you prayed for comfort, and God answered that prayer, were there not others involved to carry out His will? And I know we're swimming upstream, and I'm not trying not to get us in too deep a water here, but God works through all kinds of people. He works through people with mad skills. He works through people with no skills. He works with people with, with rock-solid faith. He works through people with no faith. And someone has said that while looking at the culture around, that there are, that when you look around, these are the masks of God behind which He wants to remain concealed and do all things. 
And so as Christians, we should be profoundly appreciative of good work done by anyone and everyone, seeing God working in all kinds of people. And when we do this, it, it brings our heads up and keeps us out of just the negative mire of this culture around us. When we see the good that is worked in this culture. Who is good but God? Someone said that, right? Maybe Jesus? Where does good come from when we see good? So even though there are people out there who may not believe what we believe, God has given them wisdom. He's given them beauty. He's given them skill. He's given them excellence. And through their work, the human race is better. Better than it would have been otherwise. And this is how God has always worked through His creation. We should go back through the Old Testament and, and start reading through the types of people that, that God worked through to accomplish His will. And as terrible as the Romans were, especially to the Jews and, and then afterward to the Christians, because of the economy of Rome and the skills and the innovation of Rome, the beginning of Christianity in the church benefited from the paved roads that Rome produced so that the gospel could be carried all over that known world. Christianity benefited from a common language developed by pagans to teach the gospel. Christianity benefited from peace in the empire during the time of Jesus. They weren't out fighting all these wars. They weren't worried about all these foreign nations coming in and, and, and disrupting and scattering this, this, the boundaries here. And so we were, the Christians were able to carry the gospel message throughout the empire. And so through the lens of the gospel... Christians should see how God always works through grace and through gifts. And it's through this lens that you can see how the whole world is aflame with the glory of God. And so sure, Satan wants to cloud all of this. That's, that's his, his mission, is to cloud all this. He'll do it through cultural wars, and he'll do it through trivial differences. And so Christians can have the tendency to be so negative about society and so negative about culture that it feeds sort of a self-righteousness in us which prevents us from engaging culture for the purpose of being the light of the world. And so we should be able to appreciate God's gifts wherever they show up. We should be able to work together with other people for the common good. In Matthew chapter 5, and verse 43, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be like your Father in heaven, since He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And so am, am I wrong to hear in this that we should be neither surprised nor resentful that God would gift the unrighteous just as He would gift the righteous for the common good? I mean, isn't this the way that we can know in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, those who have been called according to His purpose, when we see how the world around us produces good for us, even though that person producing it may not live by the same moral standard we do. They may, we may not see them as good as God reveals good. We can recognize God working, not just towards other believers, but towards everyone for the common good. So God's world is bigger than Sean. <laughs> and yet God uses all His world to benefit Sean. And you. And them. And so the gospel teaches us to enjoy God's gifts, wherever they are, and to humbly cooperate with other people for the common good. However, we know that all work is done for some reason. And so it's either done for God's glory, or it's done for the glory of someone or for something else. And so when culture, when, when work, when anything is not focused on proclaiming the glory of God, well, then that's when things start becoming distorted. That's when things get out of whack. That's when things are page three. Remember, back at the beginning, did God really say? So the gospel gives us the courage and the insight to move out of the culture of the world. And for us to say, we know there is a way to live that's shaped by what we know is the character of God. And that's how I'm going to live. That's how I'm going to conduct my life. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do things based on what is shaped by the character of God. And so the gospel shapes the way that you live because the glory of God shapes the way that you live. And so Jesus never says and God never promises that if we live by His Spirit, 
everyone around us is just going to be compelled to change their wicked ways and follow him. It's just going to happen. He never says that. He said they will see our good deeds. They will see the way that we live. They will see a different kind of culture that Jesus calls good, and they will what? When they see your good deeds, they will fall on their knees and worship God. When they see your good deeds, they will suddenly realize everything they've done is wrong. He says when they see your good deeds, they will glorify, they will give glory to God your Father. Now, how? Well, they, they may never speak His name. They may never give Him glory by speaking His name. They may never change their ways. But parents, we understand this pretty well because when someone compliments your child, when someone points out something, a good behavior or a good deed that your child has done, how do you feel about it? How does that make you feel? Don't you feel proud of them for making the right choice, for doing the right thing? And... Don't you also feel good about having been the one who influenced that? Having been the one who taught that? Having been the one who guided that? You, re you receive honor in that situation, if only indirectly. Although it was your direct influence, your direct action that led to this moment. That's our Heavenly Father. And so even when culture refuses to acknowledge God, culture honors God when it does what God gifted it to do. And culture is not good or bad. Remember, culture, culture is simply the way a group of people does things. It's the way they live their lives. And so what determines the goodness or the badness of culture is the standard by which culture is evaluated. And so when God sees aspects of culture that live up to His standard, intentionally or unintentionally, well, He is honored. And so Christians can, and we should, appreciate the things that are produced by culture that reflect the glory of God. Jonathan reminded me the other day of a quote by C.S. Lewis that says, Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you get neither. And so the culture of the church must always be one where our aim is heavenly. We are always pointing to our Father. We're always pointing to the kingdom of God. We're always reflecting our Savior and His glory. And so that's what produces the light for the world to see. Our lives reflect the glory, the illumination of God's love, of His grace, of His mercy, of His hope, of His patience, of His justice. And history has shown that when Christians get involved in law, when Christians get involved in medicine, when Christians get involved in, in government or commerce, when Christians get involved in education, when Christians get involved, Christians make the culture around them a little more humane. But when we remain on the sidelines, and when we instead are satisfied with griping and complaining because of what they are doing, or when we just sit and sulk because what we are not allowed to do, culture becomes our banyan tree, planting seeds that germinate in our hearts, in our lives, growing as a vine that's dependent on our actions for support and eventually strangling our Christian witness and absorbs us into this new mangled organism that was once an independent, fruitful organism. So we must counter the ungodly aspects of culture by being the church in our lives. Let our light shine in our lives, every angle, so others may see an opportunity for something different. They do have a choice. There is something better. There is something truly counter-cultural to Satan's destructive influence. And many times, yeah, this requires us to swim upstream, and that takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of courage. But to truly love your neighbor as yourself is not to sit silently or violently disapproving of everything you don't like about their life. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. See, that's, you heard me, that's floating with American culture. That probably sounded familiar, even though you knew it wasn't Bible. But see, the culture of the cross, God's kingdom culture, the culture of His church is to love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. And we don't do it for personal attention. And we don't do it for personal satisfaction. And we don't do it for personal gain. But we do it so that we might be like our Redeemer in heaven. Because that's why 
we were created. And that's why we were recreated in Jesus. The way to counter culture is to present them with a better choice. It's up to them to accept it. Just like you. And just like with me. And perhaps the church, that's us, perhaps the church in our daily living, God's culture, perhaps through us, this seed of the living gospel might spread in this culture so that we would choke out the destructive influences of Satan and absorb into God's kingdom way of life what was once a mangled organism producing instead a fruitful, distinct, vibrant culture where Jesus is Lord. That has to start right here in my heart, in your heart, before it can spread anywhere else. But maybe something else has started in your heart. Maybe something else has has seeded, has found a, 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 a place to root. Maybe something else is trying to take hold and strangle the life-giving hope and promise that you once had in Jesus Christ. And that is sin. And that's a choice to do something that is against God's will. But you recognize that. You repent of that. I I, I know this is wrong. I don't want to live this way anymore. And then, Father, please forgive me and help me do better. And if that's you today, we want to pray with you, for you, Stand beside you, walk with you, and is challenged to swim upstream. And if you're not a Christian, well, you're not in any stream. You've got to get in the stream of life. That's the life giving flow from the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you will confess Him as Lord and Savior today, if you will submit your life to Him, be baptized into Christ, into the watery grave. So that God can raise you up just as He did Jesus, as a new creature, a new life, new hope, a new seed. Then we want to celebrate with you today as you make that decision. We're going to stand down and sing a song of encouragement. If we can help you in any way while we're assembled together, will you please come? Hide me now under your wings, Announcements this morning, change for children, the coin banks are in the back of the auditorium. We've been talking about that for a few weeks. They're due back by September the 12th. Uh, Camp Corral, we're still t- uh, talking about sign-ups for that. The sign-ups uh, link is on the Summers app online, and then the dates are July the 25th through the 31st. And if you sign up before July the 1st, you can get a, a shirt, and the price is $195. Summertime kickoff will start uh, Wednesday, June 2nd. We'll have dinner out front. And there are T-shirts. Uh, the T-shirt order is due by today, um, and so we want to 
support our summer's youth and kids, and let's get those ordered. Um, the theme is uh, upside down, and uh, shirt sizes are in all sizes, and we encourage everyone to get one to support our kids. And our prayer list, uh, Juanita Nance has been placed on hospice care at home with her daughter, Anita Holland. Mary Hughes had cataract surgery last week. Melissa Walsh's daughter, Emily, had, uh, had her surgery, and her biopsy was clear. I saw someone come in today. I want to tell her happy birthday. Pam Lewis is here today, so today is her birthday. If you see her, give her a hug and tell her happy birthday. And Ashlyn, thank you so much for what you've done. You make my life easy, and uh, may that may not be too bad, but we appreciate it, and we wish you all the luck in your new endeavor. So thank you so much, and y'all have a great rest of your weekend and a great uh, your Sunday afternoon. Thank you. I know because of the different ages in our congregation here that many of us understand the long road in our career paths that uh, we've all participated in or will participate in. And I know that uh, Ashlyn appreciates uh, Brenda's uh, preserving and preparing the beginning of her path here with us at Summers Avenue. And we appreciate Ashlyn using her training and talents here at Summers Avenue to make things better here while she's been here. And we wish her the best in her new job. We understand how difficult change can be in our lives, but at the same time, it's very necessary in many ways. And uh, we pray that the change required for Ashlyn as she changes to a new job will be smooth. So let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all that you do and all that you have done for us. Father, we thank you for the joy that's in our lives because of what you've done for us and because of the way that you guide us uh, to live our lives. Father, we understand that that joy is part of the fruit of the Spirit, and we understand that that will increase as we grow as Christians. And Father, we pray that uh, there will be much joy in Ashlyn's life as she begins this new job, and uh, we pray that it will be an easy transition for her as she uses her training and talents in a new way. And Father, thank you for the time she has spent here with us and the difference she has made while she's been here. And we understand that... Uh, she will still be here as a member with us, but we thank you for what she's done for us in her position here. And Father, help us all to show the joy that we have uh, as being part of your family. And Father, help us to uh, help others understand the joy they can have when they're a part of your family. And Father, help us uh, to appreciate all that you do for us. In Christ's name we pray, amen.